The Chalcedon Foundation presents The American Indian A Standing Indictment Against Christianity and Statism in America Written by R. J. Rushtuni Narrated by Nathan F. Conkey Forward by Rebecca Rushtuni Rouse Reading my father's book, The American Indian, brought back a host of memories and the realisation that my Pollyanna-like childhood memories were far from the reality of life at Owe, Nevada. Perhaps because my father spent his youth among the Armenian minority in several communities and had faced discrimination, he could more easily identify with such groups as the Chinese he worked with in San Francisco during university days and the Shoshone and Paiute Indians of the Duck Valley Indian Reservation, also known as the Western Shoshone Reservation. As he did with everything, he read as much as he could about the Indians to educate himself on their history and culture, and how best to help and teach while he was serving there. As with many subjects he studied, he found that much of what experts wrote differed from what the Indians on the reservation had to say. Although this book is about his experiences over half a century ago, many of the myths and issues he confronted are still with us today. Owe is on the remote northern border of Nevada, about a hundred miles from Mountain Home, Idaho, and a similar distance from Elko to the south. Owe is nestled in barren rolling hills. There was deep snow in winter, which sometimes required my father to use snowshoes and the upstairs window to get out of the house. In summer, there were swarms of mosquitoes, and nets had to be dripped over the long clotheslines so we children could play outside. The late springs after the snow melted were beautiful. Skies were a clear blue, and cattle and an occasional mountain lion could be seen roaming along the amber or green hilltops across the road from the manse. The manse sat between the mission and the school building, and was at one end of the main road which ran along a ditch. On the other side of the road were a gas and grocery store, a drug store, and the Ohi Hospital. There were a few other businesses or buildings along the main road. Life was not easy on the reservation. Poverty was a constant problem, and it was far removed from the typical American community of its time. My father received his BA degree, English, in 1938, and his MA, Education, in 1940, both from the University of California at Berkeley. In 1944, he finished his Master of Divinity at Pacific School of Religion, also in Berkeley, and was ordained by the Presbyterian Church USA. That same year, he moved to the Western Shoshone Mission at Ogi, the only town, if it could be called that, on the Duck Valley Reservation, where he remained until early 1953. This was a time of both change and growth for my father. Far removed from the University of Berkeley and the modernist seminary he attended, it was during his time in Aoki that his conviction developed that the whole Bible and biblical law were the foundation of the Christian faith and that the Bible held the answer for every area of life. This came both from observing the disparity between those with and without faith in a broken culture as well as his studies. While working in the reservation, he read voraciously and was introduced to the works of Cornelius Van Til, which had had a major impact on the rest of his life, his writings, and the refining and growth of his faith. My father kept a series of work journals that listed briefly the day's events and what he accomplished on a given day. His days were full, often lasting well into the night. The number of tasks he accomplished the frequent trips to Elko and Mountain City on bad roads, the number of people he helped, visited or transported to various destinations, the volume of letters he wrote and the large number of funerals he presided over stand out in his journal. Each day's notation included the books he read, often multiple books in single day, both fiction and non-fiction, and by a wide variety of authors. Snowstorms, which often left my father housebound, could result in a lengthy list of volumes read 
And still it would come after a long list of chores and time spent with us children in the confines of the old manse. My father's work at the mission entailed much more than pastoring the church itself. It included working with the local school board, attending school board meetings and actually processing the school bills, including payroll. It meant organising community events, visiting local households, dealing with the often frustrating Bureau of Indian Affairs agents and getting bids for, as well as overseeing and working on, mission building projects. He frequently interceded for those who had gone afoul of the law, which usually meant a trip into Elko, and was involved in search parties for those who went astray in snowstorms. He raised animals for our meat, a goat for milk, chickens, and a garden for fresh produce or fruit. He took church boys out to help cut wood for those who needed it, and also on camping and fishing trips. More than once I remember my father delivering wood for heating and donating venison for those in need of food. He often took multiple trips in a week to Elko, Mountain City, Rio Tinto, a nearby copper mining town where I was born, and even to Boise, Idaho. Mission barrels came several times a year, containing clothing which he distributed to needy families. Some of the barrels came full of toys that were distributed at the annual Christmas program, held next door at the school. My father's journals show that he had many speaking engagements added to his workload. Between the 5th and 14th of November 1947, for instance, he travelled through snow to speak at 16 different meetings in Idaho, Oregon and Washington, and then conducted Sunday services the morning after his return to Aarhus. Yet he still managed to read nine books. To this schedule he added raising his own brood of children, five by the time he left the reservation. Even his occasional fishing trips had the dual purpose of stocking the pantry. The fish were salted and added to the dried venison stored for use throughout the year. Time was not something my father wasted. My memories of Aki are centred around my father and mission life. They are of a childhood among caring neighbours, constant visitors, and the warmth and generosity expressed by so many of the Indian families, including the Premo, Thomas, and Manning families who worked alongside my father. They included Jenny Aki, who was well over a hundred years old, and remembered her tribe being marched to the reservation, and her daughters, Judy Jack, who married a much younger man who was very ill so that she could care for him. Judy Jack often sat under the tree in front of our yard, smoking a pipe and telling us Shoshone stories about wolves, coyotes and mountain lions. Josephine Crum came frequently to help out in the manse. There were two Indian boys, Monty and Chris, who lived across the road and up the hill, and who were daily playmates. Church picnics on old army blankets in the churchyard of the manse lawn, and Indian families who came to the mission in a buckboard or in winter by sleigh. My memories include the deep concern and love my father had for the members of the mission and the people who lived in Aughi. Raised a farm boy, his attitude was down-to-earth and practical. My father's mission and the goal of his work at Aghi was very much the same as his latter work at Chalcedon and the message of his numerous books. It was and continues to be the changing of lives, of communities and our world by transforming hearts through Jesus Christ and his law word. Ordinarily, my father's works have been published as he wrote them so as not to misconstrue any of his thoughts. This work, however, obviously represented a rough manuscript. Necessary editing was done by Lee Dwigon and David Toulis, with all changes approved by my brother, Mark Rush Dooney. The chapters were written over a period of several years, ending in the 1990s. As a result, a few examples and stories were repeated. Some of these could be edited for length or deleted without any loss of meaning. One chapter was so truncated it was deleted as a chapter, but its remaining content was easily merged into other chapters so my father's narratives could be faithfully preserved. Extreme care was taken not to alter the intent of the author 